pray for class a lot, but almost every week, not every week probably, I mean almost every, every day, and I'll, not every day, anyway, I pray for engagement opportunities. I'm just, you see, I, you can tell, I keep putting it at the beginning of everything because some of the marathons, right, we, y'all know us, we love studying, we love the Greek and the Hebrew and all the mysteries and finding out things, and we're going to talk about a lot of that today, love that. But the, at the end of the day, that not translated to doing his mission and engaging means nothing. So I love it. It excites me about the Bible, and it's important, and it will help disciple people. But it means nothing if you don't take the final step and engage and do your mission. And, and it's just, that's just been buried in my mind. That's why you keep seeing it constantly. I told me, no, we're not getting rid of that segment. That's going to always be on here. Because that's our job. If we're not doing our job, we're wasting our time. Awesome. I just, oh man, that's just that's great stuff. We have, yeah, Mom. I, I'm just all sniffly this morning. <laughs> <laughs> this morning. <laughs> all right, we're skipping this. Okay. All right, so what we had is some engagement culture, of course. From this angle, we'll do that another time because that was just, that was perfect. We don't, we don't need uh, Tucker Carlson's engaging the culture if um, when we have our own. <laughs> what we were going to do is a little clip from Tucker Carlson. We'll show that maybe next week. Uh, and then we're also going to, we were going to say from Rob Ward, I will just tell you, we'll show you this last week. He sent a black and white gay Santa Claus in the Ridgeland, Mississippi uh, library. So if you think all this crazy LGBT stuff is happening everywhere, oh no, it's the Ridgeland library. We'll show you that picture later. Right okay. Oh, you just go right there. Oh, wow. Black and white gay Santa Claus in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Huh. So, children's books. Children's books. Children's books. Children's books. Children's books. Children's books. Yeah. Santa's yeah, this is Santa's husband. So just, just go there. <laughs> Uh, is that an article saying that the book is at the Ridgeland Library? I think it's some, you, what, yes. you said the Ridgeland Library and the other thing on top of this is if you are, if you if you have a history of using American Girl as your Christmas gift <laughs> yes. and the American Girl book that I think was put out this year embedded in there is indoctrination language um, that most parents won't have a clue that they buy this stuff for years and years and years, and, um, and it's, 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 it's hidden in plain sight. Mm -hmm. wow. what, do you, what do you got? So that was, do you like it? or I mean, did you use that? Lots it. of American Girl doll. My childhood is ruined. <laughs> 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 and here's this, don't forget. Oh, yeah, the other one was the Balenciaga. Yeah, 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 don't like Mattel. That's all you need to know. They have a transgender doll. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous. And so we'll talk about this maybe next week. But y'all, I'm sure you did hear. Have, have, have y'all heard about the uh, yeah. Valencia? Uh, Valencia. Uh, y'all heard about that ad? A lot of you did. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that next week. All the, all the way from child molestation to satanic imagery. It's incredible what's in that. We heard a, who was it today? It's somebody that was criticizing Christians about saying you're taking it. At, no, no, it was the parent. It was her parent. Her parent from England, an English parent, was criticizing because you're taking it out of context. And I just, Meredith told me this, read this to me this morning, of course I blow up. And I can, taking it out of context, it's a photograph. The picture is the, the context. context. You don't have a person explaining it to you to give you a different context. A staged picture is the context. You can't take a staged picture out of context because the picture creates an image and you create the content. That's what a picture is. So it just flew all over me that the parent, this, this child's parents that you're taking out of context. You can't. It's a picture. I can see it. That is the context. Anyway. But, but that's the culture that we live in. I showed my dad the Ten Commandments from the Roman Catholic Church Catechism and the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. He's just like that British mother. He said, well, that's your opinion. Opinion? <laughs> 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 Exhibit A, exhibit B. Yeah, but yeah they're different. Oh, that's wild. Okay, let's see. We got about twenty minutes. <laughs> we're gonna, we're, what we're doing today? This is gonna be fun. Can we finish early? Yes, we'll finish. Early. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can just stop here and finish early. Cause... I go to Carol's. Anybody going to Carol's today? Yeah, a lot of today. We went last night. At three, seven o'clock. We didn't go at seven. We went at three. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Where are we, Meredith? I don't have any idea where we are. Rhetorical question. Okay. Here's what we're gonna talk about. First of all, what are we celebrating right now? Christmas, which is the what of Christ? We're going to talk about his death today. <laughs> We're going to talk about Christ's death. Okay, all right, so here's my rhetorical question. Why are we talking about Christ's death when it is December and we should be celebrating his birthday? Something is wrong here. It ain't April. Okay, that's my rhetorical question. And say, it ain't April, so why are we talking about that? April being Easter, which of course is a pagan holiday also. 
But that's a whole other story. <laughs> Here's the answer. In December, we are celebrating our holidays with a big O-U-R with a line under it there in the notes. You know, nothing in my notes or it's by accident. The O-U-R, uh, we are celebrating in December our holidays. While, uh, while God instructs his people to celebrate others. So that's what we're kind of talking about today is kind of what, what we do culturally and Christian culture. Again, nothing wrong with that. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying you should be celebrating Christmas. But I'm just saying that we're celebrating a set of holidays, but there are actual holidays in the Bible that God commands us to celebrate, not commands, excuse me, that are celebrated in the Bible. So we're going to look at those a little bit. Uh, Meredith should read the typical modern day to-do list. This is actually my to-do list, okay? <laughs> I, I've had, I, I'm a list maker, so have to forgive me. Put up your Christmas. This is December to-do list, so really I like to start it before December. Put up my Christmas yeah. tree. Put up my outdoor decorations. Do my Christmas cards, which by the way, I decided not to do Christmas cards. First time cards in the history of our lives, she didn't do Christmas cards. Joel's like, are you feeling Plus, okay? Yeah, it's like, it's a green. Oh my goodness. You know what's bad is I bought 247 Christmas stamps. I have no idea what to do with them. They're sitting on my desk. All year long. I have so Christmas as an stamps. aside, I love you all, but you're not getting a Christmas card. She's like, I'm not doing this year. Take a picture of it on Facebook, the same thing. There you go. Okay. That's a good point. So do your Christmas cards. Go to Carol's by Candlelight. Shop for, wrap a present for every family member and put it under your tree. Including the ones you can't stand. You know go to all the Christmas parties. <laughs> Oh yeah, make a charity donation before the end of the year. That's Meredith's to-do list. Okay, or, or a typical to-do list. Okay, right. here are the key verses on today. These are some verses that are gonna, we're gonna kinda use as a key verse. It, basically, this is two weeks, today and next week. Okay, Meredith, what is the first key verse? Listen to this verse. These are the verses that we're gonna bounce off of. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. I know you're not looking because she has the story, but this is like her favorite we verse. We know who we love this verse. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, remember the former things, those of long ago. So right now, I'm gonna, I told her I wasn't gonna pause earlier this, I'm going to. <laughs> So take that, you got to slow down for a minute, because when you read the scripture, every word matters. This is God himself telling them to remember. So the first thing you're supposed to do is you are to remember. All right, I'm going to be quiet. Take That's a word. very important word. Yeah, remember. God, he uses it a lot. If, oh, I'm going to just, oh, go ahead, I'm breaking it off. He uses already. it a lot when we worship on Sunday yeah. instead of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And he uses the word remember the Sabbath. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> I'm not church traditions, but I digress. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of fits along. Um, Ready? Okay, I was going to tell you that's something about the verse. Every word matters. Every word remember. Oh, y'all all, y'all know how much we have just fallen in love with the chosen. <coughs> what keeps happening in the chosen? We're going back and rewatching a lot of the first season because we're teaching it to the youth. And, uh, and uh, what keeps it's all about remembering, remembering, remembering. That's what they're all doing because they were all doing all this stuff that was, well, we're about to talk about it. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. We're talking about uh, these rehearsals. They had been performing rehearsals for over 1,500 years. And so when Jesus showed up, they remembered. So anyway, that, so think about kind of what you saw in that first season of The Chosen. It was all about what they had been practicing so that their memory was ready when it happened. So anyway. So the reason we actually went back to this today, because we've taught it before, is... I already told me, you you're, you're a member of this. Because we are celebrating a very big holiday, and I love Christmas. It's a great time of year. Um, but God specifically told us to remember certain things. So, remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, the key. and there is none like me. This key. I make known the end from the beginning. He makes known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is yet to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. Really, that is a statement by the creator that in the universe. I make known the end from the beginning, and my purpose will stand. You can count on that. And that means whatever's going to happen down there, he's made it known from the that means, well, it's talking about this. It's a prophetic word. We're going to talk about that. Okay, now, so that's the Old Testament in Isaiah where God himself tells you, that's what I do. Now we're going to run all the way forward, our New Testament Christianity. The very first 
interaction or, or quote of Jesus Christ that Luke makes. In, in another gospel, it's, it's a conversation with Mary Magdalene, too. But Luke, the first, would anybody know what, well, no, just see the notes here. What's the first conversation that Luke records that Jesus makes? It's the, con con it's the conversation on the road to Emmaus. What does Jesus tell them on the road? So after the accomplishment on the cross and the resurrection, what's the first thing that he points to, Jesus points to? Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about several to seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they walked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. You remember this? You remember that little side story we did a few weeks ago about the only thing, only man-made thing in heaven, and why didn't people recognize Jesus? This was one of the episodes. But. He asked them, "What are you discussing together as you walk along?" They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, "Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that, that have happened there in these days?" What would Chuck Mister say right here about this next statement? This shows that Jesus had a sense of humor. Sense of humor. I think he's a big Chuck Missler fan too. I love it. He, when Chuck Missler would say these this passage, he would always say that Jesus just was crucified, beaten, rose from the dead. What's his response? But they said, "Are you a visitor? Do you not know what's going on?" What is Jesus' quip? What things? He what asked. things? <laughs> God Himself, Jesus Christ, has a sense of humor. After Jesus, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, "He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people." The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are. And so here's the first. Slow, so what did Jesus point to? How foolish you are. And how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And here's the first. And beginning with Moses. Beginning with Moses. And all the prophets. And all the prophets. He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Amen. Isn't that awesome? So you go back to Isaiah who says, God himself says, I made known the end from the beginning. And when the Messiah was dead, buried, and resurrected, the first thing he says to these men is he points back to that Old Testament and says how every word of it is meaning. Because God makes it known the end from the beginning. And what was some of that? Now, this is just, you could have a thousand different uh, teaching sessions on what did Jesus teach them. Y'all know that it's a seven mile estimates are I think it's a seven or eight mile walk I hadn't, I hadn't looked at this in years but I think it's a seven or eight mile it's walk seven mile. seven mile walk they said it back to Jerusalem and they said they did it in haste well they walked on the way down there so I uh, think people have calculated how long it was I think it's probably about, about two hours so it would have been about a two hour walk can you imagine a two hour sermon teaching series with the creator of the universe who's just risen from the dead that is the most incredible thing and we have no idea what was said other than he took the Old Testament and showed them that it was me. That I can only look. one day when I get to heaven, I want to know, repeat for me a, everything that you it's said. Right, it's right of you. Well, yeah, it really is it's the Old Testament. It's connect the dots. That's a good point. That's a, we have to connect the dots. No, Great point. He will let you to connect the dots. His holy, His holy Spirit is here, connecting it. Just dig in. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> so we already have it. We have it. I love it. We that's a great perspective. It it's written down. Yes. Because he and didn't you sit in your chair and do it. I love it. <laughs> right. Oh, that's a great point. I still, still like to watch it on YouTube, though. Yeah, I would still like to watch it. It'd be awesome. Oh, you I love it. Oh, that's so true. Can you imagine, though? Can you imagine what these two did? So, anyway. Can we so nail a coffin? And then nail another coffin? Yeah, Isaiah 114. And well, you can go back to 13 if you want to read it later. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. Mm. They have become a burden to me, which is heresy wow. considering where we are. <laughs> it's right there. Yeah, it's right there. <laughs> I love it. All right, so those we're going to take those two verses, that perspective of God's <coughs> giving, and we're going to run with that for. 
<laughs> in the first appearance of Jesus, which Luke records, Jesus points to his disciples to the Old Testament. By the way, here's my side thing. Here's my side note. Because so many of y'all on page, where do we get most of our, outside of the church, where do we get most of our sermons? We hear the, the latest good teacher, the latest young preacher somewhere. This is, and I always say this morning, you'll heard me say this over and over <coughs> You get a lot of young evangelical preachers, and they don't even make any beans about it anymore. You get some of these in the Baptist church even. The, a lot of the younger guys who basically say, we are a New Testament church. The Old Testament is dead. It is gone. We don't even read that junk anymore. We're here. And I'm being a little facetious about much. You can, you can look at some of the clips. They basically say that. That is garbage, and that's a heresy, and that is wrong. And I, I, don't, I do not shy away from that. That doesn't mean that some of these teachers don't teach wonderful little feel-good sermons and great, and, and can give you some good discipleship in other areas, maybe. But if a preacher is telling you that, that is dead wrong because Jesus Christ himself took these two men to the Old Testament and said it to me. And so that, that, just, that drives me crazy when I see good, should be good evangelical preachers saying stuff like that. That's not true. You want to say something, I know it. No, nope. okay. <laughs> okay, so that's my uh, that's my hobby horse. I jump on that a lot because it just makes me mad that we get too many. I'm sorry. No, no more side stories, stories because we won't get a little further. Okay, did you pass this out? Yes. All right, you do that. This is just something that we got from Chuck Missler and Hidden Frick. This is the the Bible's theme in five points. Yeah, if you want to know <laughs> what the whole story of the Bible is in five simple points, go to The Old Testament is an account of a nation. Israel. The New Testament is the account of a man. Jesus. The Creator became a man. His appearance is the central event of all history. He died to purchase us and is alive now. The most exalted privilege is to know him, and that's what the Bible is all about. In just five little tidbits, that's what the Bible is all about. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that cool? So you like that too? <laughs> We all take that. I just love that. Okay, so we're on the first page of the notes. We're on Roman numeral five. Oh, this is okay. This is Meredith's goal. So we're gonna skip that. This yeah, we're going to Roman numeral six. Christian. Now we're gonna lay the groundwork for this. And bear with me now, because uh, you know you can always theologically parse this away. But just bear with me for a minute. Christianity is not a separate religion. That's the argument I'm about to make. Christianity is not a separate religion. Modern Christianity, we have separated two. Judaism is back there. Christianity is over here. It's different. That kind of is where you come from, this idea of modern preachers saying the Old Testament is dead. We're New Testament church only. All this kind of stuff. I'm going to argue that, they're, that, Christ, that the better way of looking at Christianity is Christianity is Judaism fulfilled. It's what it is. It's one continuing process. It's one continuing process of God's plan. Missler used to say, that if there's any part of the Bible he would tear out, you know what it was? He thought, oh, he's heresy. He said, like the book of Exodus or something. No, he said, I tear out the white sheet that separates the Old Testament from the New Testament because it's one continuous book. But anyway, so I, I, did, I took that out of the notes, but I just throw it out there. Uh, I love say, that. Did you say Christianity is Judaism revealed? Fulfilled and revealed, exactly. We're about to hit on that. All right, so um, our salvation is from the Jews. We'll just state things instead of going to the verse. But y'all know this verse. It's John 4. It says salvation is of the Jews. Romans 1, 16 through 17 says that, that the gospel is to the Jew first and then the Gentiles. So you got these New Testament uh, passages that link the two. Christianity is Judaism fulfilled. So let's talk about this. Now you got to follow this. I think we have it written on the board too. No, we don't. Follow this. And this is what you were talking about. The New Testament, the New Testament, the New Testament is in the Old Testament, concealed, which is why Jesus spent two hours explaining to them what the Old Testament was all pointing to him. So I'm going to say that again. The New Testament is in the Old Testament, concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament, now revealed. And that's the point. They fit together fully. And, you, and I will dogmatically say this. You will not more fully. We can never fully understand God. You will not understand God's plan anywhere close to some full nature, whatever that means, if you simply read your New Testament and ignore your old. And the reverse is true, too. If you explicitly spend your time in the Old Testament and don't understand, because the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. I always say this. People love the book of Revelation. Oh, it's all this mystical stuff. My numbers won't be right, but I think it's like there are 400 verses in Revelation in the book of Revelation, there are 800 references to the old, distinct references to the Old Testament. That means that in the book of Revelation, there are more two, there are 
there are on average two verse, two references to the Old Testament for every verse written. You cannot possibly understand the book of Revelation without incredibly detailed understanding of the Old Testament, which is why most pastors will not teach the book of Revelation because they don't have that kind of understanding. Oh, did I say that out loud? I did. I'm sorry. Let's keep moving. Uh, that is why, because you cannot understand it. It's all the Old Testament. That's what's happening there. Okay, I gotta move on. Better sing shut up. Okay, we stri uh, Christianity in 2022 have nearly disconnected from all that is Jewish. We strip Christ of his Judaism so much. For example, the Last Supper. What was if we know this? At the Last Supper, what was what was Christ uh, celebrating? Passover. Passover. That was Passover. It was one of these seven feasts we're talking about. That's what we so. You know, a lot of Christians now, Meredith asked me this, if you could stop our congregation on Sunday morning and just say, hey, what was Jesus celebrating that day? I don't know. And I'm worried evangelical church, Bible believing church. I would think most of them would know that was Passover. Yeah. I bet you 50% yeah. of the room would not say Passover. They, they know it was something, but they yeah, would not even make that link. Is to see if they oh, know. Our kids would know. I hope they do. They should know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, but you go to some churches. <laughs> Outside of say an evangelical church, I mean, there's nobody in the room would even know that. They have no idea. I don't know. The Last Supper is just what they did before he crossed Chris. They would have no idea the connection of what's going on. Okay, she's telling me to shut up, hurry up. Okay, I'm with you. There are seven feasts. They're listed on the board. We'll talk about some more later. Here they are. We'll talk more about that because she wants me to get to this video. Let's quickly say Mikra and Moed. Because again, I'm making the argument that. Christianity is Judaism fulfilled. They're not two separate things. To me, it's an obvious argument. What does Paul say? Paul talks about that his, in Romans 9, 10, 11, there are Jews. You know, what about what do we say about the Jews? And the whole concept is we are what in? And it begins with a G. We are grafted in, which tells you that it's not an ending and a new thing. We are grafted in to the very prophets and the word of, and the and the, the law and the word and everything else that's already existed. So I don't like this idea of separating the two. We are grafted in. But anyway. Okay. Now, with that said, Mikra and Moed. Mikra is a Hebrew word. Mikra means rehearsals. That's what these feasts are. They are Mikras. They are rehearsals. But what is a rehearsal for? You're practicing for a performance. How many times did y'all rehearse before carols? No. I know. I know. You rehearse, you rehearse, you rehearse, you rehearse. And because then, you have a... Because you have a Moed and appointed time. Oh, this is a great example. I'm just kidding. Just right now. So y'all rehearse for months. You perform Mikras, rehearsal, 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 rehearsal. But... In mind, at all times, there was a moed, 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 it's, it's pronounced right. a moed. There was a moed, there was an appointed time. In your case, you had four of them. <laughs> four performances. That's what is happening in your Old Testament. That's what these feasts are. They're rehearsals, the mikras. Rehearse, 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 four appointed time. That's why... Oh, let me, let me this. read this. That's why with the chosen, they were all like, we were watching, we were watching, we were watching, we were, we were watching, and you're here now. That's what you're seeing in the chosen. Why? Because they've been practicing these feasts because God set them up as rehearsals to for an appointed time one day. Because God said in the first the first time you see in the Bible, Genesis 1, 14, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the night from the day and let them serve as signs to mark Seasons. Which is Moed. The English word, trans, the word translated season there is Moed. It's an appointed time, a season, a rehearsal, or a festival. That is the way so you it's could translated. Say, to serve as a sign to mark appointed times and or, days and years. Or festivals. You and then you flip over to what we just went through in Colossians. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come, a practice, a rehearsal. The reality, however, is in Christ. So what does Paul tell you? He tells you that the New Testament was in the Old Testament concealed, which is now being revealed. Paul is telling you in Colossians that we just spent 16 weeks going through, but that's what's happening here. It's so awesome. It's just so, that's why I say it's, just, it's one thing. You don't separate. Okay. Uh, Meredith, you ready to go straight to that video? Yes. All right, Meredith wants you to see this video. I want you to see the chosen video we have at the end. We ain't getting that. <laughs> but this is about an 11-minute video that just walks you through a quick Seder. Not a Seder. A quick okay. Passover. Gives you a little bit of the image. It's a Seder. Yeah. It is. Which we were able to participate in this. one. Yes. yes. So yeah. maybe we can do it this year. Yeah. Class. So when you see this, this is just like, 
this is what you did. Mm -hmm. right. So take a look at this, and then we'll pick up here, I guess, next week. Let me see. As it gives us last supper, the disciple, there is a big question mark in Western readers. Hardly any of us have ever experienced a full Passover meal. Obviously, it was important to him, he explained to his disciples, that he had looked forward to doing this with them. And it was something that they did on an annual basis. So to have something that was so integral to his last week and the night of his arrest is really something that we need to spend some time and try to figure out. And Barry found a place where we were able to go and not experience the full three, four hour Passover feast, but a very condensed Passover feast. Having the opportunity to sit down and have the same dishes served to us and explain their significance and meaning was very beneficial. Hello. Hello. We serve what we call biblical meals here. I'm one of the main people who leads Passover meals. We basically do a very shortened, approximately half an hour presentation that is integrated with the food and the symbolic foods that we have passed down to us by tradition to this very day. There's actually often uh, all kinds of singing involved in Passover. Families get together, it's a family event. And so the first element, this is the plate with symbols in it. Near to the beginning of the meal, we begin tasting things, you know, even though we may not eat traditionally for an hour or two, we start tasting stuff just so people don't get too antsy. And so we've got the sprigs of parsley. Sprig of parsley, a symbol of life, and also the hyssop that was used to smear the blood on the doorposts, dipped into the salt water, representing the tears of the children of Israel because of the slavery in Egypt, and parsley with salt water. That's really salty. <laughs> The brownish stuff is actually sweet, and it represents the mortar. So we know that they built two whole cities for the pharaohs, it says in scripture. It's sweet, generally this is interpreted that even though you work hard, hard work is actually good for humans. And then finally, we have the bitter herbs. And it's supposed to be hot enough that when you taste it, it makes you cry. Again, this idea of relating to the children of Israel in Egypt and their slavery. What we do is, first, we taste the bread on its own. So we have a sense of what it's like to eat unleavened bread on its own. And this stuff is really nice. Uh, but the stuff that we actually normally eat in Passover, it's kind of like a saltless cracker. So we taste the bread. Then we taste it with the bitter herbs, which is very important because the bitter herbs are actually commanded to be eaten. And so we take some of the bitter herbs. Hopefully this is sharp enough to make us cry a little bit. Then we have a tradition, not something commanded in scripture, of mixing uh, the symbol of mortar with the symbol of suffering. And so we basically, uh, we kind of put them together and uh, we eat it. It's definitely bitter. There's some bitter in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They complement each other a yeah, lot. They do. Mm -hmm. And finally, the shank of a lamb. Uh, this is purposefully, uh, looks like it's been fired because the lambs are supposed to be cooked over a live fire and not boiled in water or anything else. And this reminds us, of course, of the original lamb in Egypt that the children of Israel slaughtered and used the hyssop to smear the blood on the doorposts and the lentils of their houses. And also then the perpetual sacrifice that was supposed to go on every year at the temple or the tabernacle to remember every year sacrifices were made at the Passover in remembrance of the original Passover in Egypt. So you were mentioning some of these elements over here. You mentioned the bitter herbs. That was a part of that. During Jesus' Passover meal, it mentions that he dipped his hand in the dish. Mm -hmm. What was that referring to? My, my impression with my memory yeah. says that it was some kind of sop. Usually sop was some kind of vinegary mixture. We see an example of this also in the book of Ruth, where when she's invited by Boaz to, to partake, there's some kind of vinegar sock there, 
that is part of their daily meal. So I think that's what that would have been. However, it's possible that maybe one of these elements also could have been the case. Right? When we celebrate our Passover meal, there's a sort of an order of service that I will go through. The cup is pretty primary. There's four cups of wine that we drink. Right. And they're based actually on the text in Exodus that's full of I wills. God this says, I will take you out well, of slavery. I will free you. I will bring <coughs> you to myself, etc. And it's interesting that traditionally the third cup after the meal is the cup of salvation. And it seems that Jesus picks up after the meal the cup and establishes what we call communion with the cup. I found this interesting because he says it appears, we, the reason it does appear that it had to have been this third cup that Jesus picked up, because right after that verse it says, they sang a hymn and left. So it was at the end of the meal. And if you know the order of ceremony, he was probably that cup that what we call the, um, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? The, well, the, the cup that is the communion, communion was this cup. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week, the four cups. But it's just interesting that he used this cup. And then what, do y'all remember what he says after that? He said, and I won't drink this cup with you until we're, drink it again. until I drink it again. Or that's the fourth cup. And if you know what that fourth cup is, you go, yeah, because he's got to return for that cup. Anyway, it's just really fascinating. We'll talk about that later. The salvation, which is what he's about to accomplish that night and the next day on his death on the cross. And so that's very significant, the symbol of the vine. Wine is actually not mentioned in Exodus. But we have it by tradition, and of course, when Jesus with his disciples sit down to celebrate the Passover meal in what we call today the Last Supper, there's wine present, of course, on the table. And in the Jewish tradition, wine has a few meanings. First, it's a symbol of joy and of God's provision, but also, especially because of the color, it's also associated it with blood. And so this thing that Jesus does, I believe that is already established as having a connection to blood. Then we also have this interesting setup with the unleavened bread. We have three pieces of bread that are separated by linen. And this is a specific... I'm pausing this because we're going to run out of time. I just want you to see these points. Make, notice that there are three... He's, t he's about to tell you there are three unleavened bread that are wrapped up separately. And there are three of them. And because of the order, we know which one Jesus grabbed. And he's going to describe that. He grabbed the middle one. Think of it, if you will, uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity. The thing that's related to the Passover celebration. And so we have a very curious tradition. It's not really clearly they don't even know explained. Why they and that is we take the third of the matzahs that is in here. And at a certain point in the service, we break it. They do this every time. And we take half and put it back together between the other two pieces. Again, this was the middle piece. And then we take half and we uh, wrap it in another piece of linen, and this is hidden. I'll pause there, because I want you to get this. Jews today do this, and they're doing it for thousands of years, and they don't understand why. In none of their writing, because the Old Testament, the New Testament was concealed, they don't have a reason for why they're doing this. They have speculations that the rabbis did later, but it's not written why they do this, but they've been doing it. But now you understand why Jesus took it and broke it as he's talking. What does he say? He was doing this. Body. My body, which he, he defines it. It wasn't defined in the Bible. It. He defines it. Hey, by the master's banquet, who's doing the presenting. And the children go on a treasure hunt after dinner is over. And this has to be found. He will redeem it, either for money or a gift. Father and will redeem it. And as a final dessert, even if Mother created all kinds of dessert unleavened, of course. This will be eaten at the end afterwards, and nothing basically else will be eaten that night. Everyone, of course, has stuffed a big meal. This is very significant. It has a curious name, afikoman, which seems to be a Greek word. One possible meaning is, I have come. <laughs> this is curious. This is hidden away, and then it's brought back, redeemed, and then it is partaken of. And so, as a Messianic Jew, I believe that this is a wonderful symbol for Jesus. Notice he is in, in the middle, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, perhaps, right? His human nature, he dies, and he's wrapped in linen and buried away. But his eternal nature cannot die, and so it remains with God. And God resurrects him, and Jesus takes the bread, and he blesses it, and he gives it to the disciples, says, take and eat of this. This is my body broken for you. And we see this connection with the New Testament, very beautiful, because all the other explanations for this in Jewish tradition, leave something to be desired.
So those are the basic elements of the Passover meal. And just in brief, their significance according. All right, we're about out of time. We're gonna let y'all see this real quick. Not that sad. Can you grab one of that? Um, isn't that amazing? That's just an 11 minutes. You can, we could spend weeks diving in, and we're gonna spend a little bit of time next week. We could spend weeks diving into some of this imagery, especially the four cups, but that's fascinating. So you realize that as a New Testament Christian with zero, if you had zero, if you have zero understanding of Jewish tradition, you, miss, you would miss 90% of what's actually going on at that Last Supper. And I just find that fascinating. There's so many little tidbits there that you can learn when you realize, wow, Jesus was literally fulfilling a very prescript, very specific order of service that had been done at that point for 1,500 years and has now been done for 3,500 years because Jesus continues to do this today. Uh, by the way, we, we got couldn't get all of that, oh, yeah. that pamphlet on there, so you'll have to get the Jewish names from here and transpose the uh, real names. But Passover is the top line, is that top paragraph. But I will say, just like in closing, um, that's why when they were praying for the Messiah and crazy John the Baptist out in the wilderness was baptizing and he saw Jesus walking, what did he, what did say? he say? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb, the Lamb of, God. of God. Because they were practicing it for 15 And they were about years. to. And they were about to. Behold yeah. the Lamb of God who yeah. takes away the because sin. Because they the had been rehearsing for an appointed time. And what John the Baptist said is, now is the appointed time. That's what he was saying. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. I thought you were going to read through that. Oh. I, well, <laughs> I said it basically here. Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples, saying that he eagerly desired to eat this Passover with them before he suffered, and that he would not eat it again until the kingdom of God comes. And after the Passover meal, they sang a hymn, and well, we know what the hymn is. We know. So I, we grew up with a wonderful, I mean, an incredible pastor. Yeah, that man before the Bible was my an, an unbelievable pastor. But he used to. Oh, this is such a strong memory in my mind. Yeah. When he would read this, when we were taking communion, he would literally say every time he would say. Don't you wish we knew what they sang? And then he would continue on. We do. Because it was the same are. song that was done for 1,500 years. Now, our songs. We know exactly what they sang. So they sang a hymn and went to the Mount of Olives. The hymn sung during Passover yes. is the Hallel, which includes Psalm 118.22. So they were singing this that night. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Jesus is the capstone that the builders rejected. Jesus was crucified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance of his sacrifice <coughs> as the perfect Passover Lamb and the fulfillment of the new covenant between God and man. Prophecy of the sacrifice is found in Psalm 22, and the prophet Isaiah spoke of the sufferings and sacrifices of the Messiah uh, crushed for our iniquities and how that sacrifice would be the ultimate atonement for the sin. Isn't that incredible? Imagine that night and they were literally singing about the man that was standing in front of them that would be crucified later that night and the next day that had been practiced for 1500. It had been rehearsed for that appointed time. The last thing I'll say, and this is, I took this out of the notes because it's more of what we talked about last time. I'm just going to throw it out there. What does Jesus say on the cross? Uh, well, there's lots it of several things. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's several things he said on the cross. One thing he says on the cross, which I, it was always a little disturbing to me. Yeah, well, let me say what it is. What is Jesus says on the cross that, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that's always been a little disturbing to me because did God actually forsake him? Did he turn his back? You know, and you have modern day pastors a lot of And I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just telling you, it disturbed me because it, theologically that doesn't really make sense to me. But we've wrapped it into the idea of a sin paid for model on the cross and all that. None, none of which is incorrect. That's all true. But anyway, so you hear that statement, why, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? You hear a lot of New Testament pastors kind of contort themselves to explain why he said that. Do you know what that is the beginning of? It's Psalm 22. It is, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? In Psalm 22, what Jesus, I believe what Jesus was at, you don't have to contort yourself and wonder what God was actually doing and speculate. What Jesus was doing on the cross was he was telling the people that were right there. Now he was telling us because it would be recorded in the Bible for all of us to read. He was saying, Psalm 22 was me. He was quoting the beginning of Psalm 22. What happens when you go and read Psalm 22? It's a description of Christ on the cross. 
that's where he was pointing to. So I don't think you have to contort yourself and wonder what was happening in the mystical world. I think he was saying, this is what it is. The appointed time has arrived yes. and you're watching it. Yes, Isn't yes. That cool? Because there were no markers back then. There wasn't a number of Psalm 23. Yeah, they didn't say, hey, y'all go check Psalm 23. Yeah. He quoted it. He quoted the beginning of it. Which, of course, the next chapter is, the Lord is my shepherd, I, I shall, shall not want. want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Isn't that cool? Okay, we got to go to church. We just love this stuff. And this is what, it, what Meredith, we skipped. This was part of our testimony very early on, probably 15, 20 years ago. What really got us into a lot of the type of studying we do now was Missler and following some of these paths. And that's when we finally woke up one day and thought, there's a heck of a lot of the Bible that I don't know. And it just sent us on this crazy journey. Okay, let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much. The Bible is so exciting. And understanding and just figuring out little tidbits and little treasures that, that you buried throughout that Bible for your people to discover and to find and to, and, to, and, to, and to see. It's just amazing. Thank you, Father. Thank you for carols. Father, bless the one more performance. May people come to know the Lord and appreciate everything you did through that presentation. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay. 10